part of digital transformation, you also want to quickly experiment with new applications and new services. You want to do something like A-B testing, right? Where you see how your, your website visitors actually react to specific features. And then there's the deployment, the deployment of new and existing applications in, in seconds. All of the heavy lifting was done during the build. And that's important because those people who develop the applications know how to, to build and configure it. And, and the traditional model was more like, yes, you, someone develops the um, application, but then the operations people need to figure out how that really works in, in production. And, and that's also eased by containerization of your application. So now let's quickly look at a workload density. On the, on the left side, you have virtual machines. And on the right hand side, you have containers. And, and really, what you should look at is those white boxes on the right hand side, because on the on the left hand side you see all your all your uh, CPU and your your memory and your storage is consumed by those uh, VM images, those virtual machine images, and they also have a gray layer on uh, at the bottom, which is an operating system layer, which means every single time you have a VM starting, you have an entire operating system being uh, installed on that. Containers are quite different. The gray layer is, is thinner because it's really just the libraries and the binaries you need to run your applications, but the, the kernel, the operating system as such, is actually shared and hence less resource um, consuming. And, and that gives you space to actually then scale out your, your cloud native applications as such. So now looking at, at this image, it says containers on the top, but it's actually the two gray boxes that you need to look at, which is um, which signifies a, a container. So you have the, the application running in the container, and you have the supporting files and the runtime. And underneath, you have an operating system and the server. And that server itself could be either a bare metal server or it could be a, a virtualized server. You also see the, the Linux component. That's That's very important because that actually allows you to run your containers as securely and as, as well managed as you do your, your standard operating systems. And then you often hear in terms of um, when the topic of containers come, comes up, you, you often hear the, the Docker word. And, and Docker is really a packaging format that has now been renamed actually to, uh, to Mobi and it's been now governed by OCI, the Open Container Initiative. But really what it is, it's, it's just a format that allows you to specify what applications and what runtime behaviors you actually, um, and dependencies you actually require to run your, your, your containerized applications. And you can have in a, in a runtime environment, like the blue box on that screen, you can have actually multiple containers that are all separated as a, um, as a process as such. Now, back to the analogy of, um, of the, uh, the loading dock. As I said earlier, you load the applications at the factory, not, the, not at the dock. And, um, and if you see on the, in, the, in the upper um, area, you see actually how that uh, poor guy who is loading the ship is sweating, right? Because he needs to manually load all those, um, all those goods on the, on the container ship. And he doesn't really know how to. Whereas on the, on the bottom part, you see that the, the person who knows how to best load and configure the container is the uh, gentleman with the tie because he actually wrote that, that application. He knows exactly how it best fits into an, uh, in a container. And then the operations guy in the lower part is the, the crane driver who knows what to expect. The container image is what he expects. And all he has to worry about is really to deploy that uh, container image and to handle the container image as it is uh, prescribed by um, the IT governance function and IT security. And that makes it very easier to, to run those uh, containers then in production. So now we've got different stakeholders in, in that scenario. We have the architects and the developers. And you see this uh, image on the right hand side. I, I relate to that because you sort of get emotionally attached to your first container, right? You might even call it <laughs> call it names, you know, like uh, I don't know, Sarah or James. I don't know. It's uh, it really happens because you sort of you sort of proud, right? You got your first uh, Docker container running on your laptop, and um, it's something big. The 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 drawback of this is really this attachment, which which often uh, comes out in a new vision where people like go like, um, okay, so I'm going to build my own container 
container platform because it was so easy to run a, a container on your laptop. But um, and this is also what I want to stress in this uh, session today: that running a single container in your, your on your laptop has pretty much I don't want to say nothing, but very little to do with running enterprise scale containers because there are so many different building blocks you need to to think of um, to to make this happen. And um, so we're gonna go in the, into this topic in a bit more detail in, in subsequent slides. Then, um, then you in the beginning you obviously manually pack your containers because you want to make sure it's it's all working and, uh, as expected, and and you know and and you want to test it and then change configuration so that you you know this is uh, the behavior is as expected. But really, what you need to strive for in a container environment is really the auto automatic uh, packing of your of your application. That's often described as uh, DevOps or CI/CD continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment, and um, also when you think about a microservices architecture, it's really a, a DevOps and an automated approach is really a fundamental building block of, of that. You cannot keep up with thousands of, of moving parts as part of microservices or thousands of, of, of moving containers manually. So that's really why. DevOps or the automation or CI/CD is, is really a mandatory part. Otherwise, uh, it'll be very, very hard. Then, in the operation space, then once you have your container images ready, then the, the operations guy can decide where and how you want to deploy your containers. That could be multiple infrastructures, or service providers, for example. That could be a hybrid cloud environment. That could be a, a platform as a service, or it could be on on a virtualized environment like your VMware farm or your Red Hat Enterprise uh, virtualization, um, or it could be your own private cloud um, as OpenStack, for example, in your data centers. But it, it really gives the businesses the power to deploy and to run their workloads wherever they, they need to run it. It might even be um, a sensitive workload that you're only allowed to run in your own on-premise data center as opposed to a lower cost uh, alternative somewhere else. So that's really where operations and, and business benefits and containers all, all meet to give businesses uh, the, the power to decide where to run their applications in a very easy way. So now the, the Red Hat container platform is called OpenShift. You might have heard that, but you could also refer to it as Enterprise Kubernetes Plus. And those are the layers that I, I wanted to talk a, a bit more before that I mentioned, right? So some people they, they run their own Docker container on on their laptop and they think I'm gonna, you know, build the platform, the container platform myself. But then, if you just look at the different layers, right? There is an operating system layer like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or the Atomic Host, which is a stripped down version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux that is optimized for container workloads. And then you've got on the bottom, you've got what I just mentioned, the different physical, virtual, private, and, and public uh, infrastructure providers that um, are certified to run Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which means you know that whoever hosts your, your operating system or your container platform is actually certified to do so, and you will also get, get support for that, because when you call Red Hat up for support, we're not going to point you to someone else's support, because we know this is um, certified against that, that platform and will help you to to um, resolve any issues. Then on top of that, you see the infrastructure automation and, and cockpit layer. That's something like infrastructure as code is, is the paradigm where you could, for example, use your, your Ansible playbooks to um, set up your container platform. And the container platform itself then is um, containing several more building blocks like networking, storage, registry, and uh, log aggregation, and, and also security. So now if you think of uh, like network isolation, OpenShift comes alone with three overlay networks out of the box. So there's the inter-container inter communication network, there's the back-end services uh, network, and then is the front, the external facing public IP network. And, and that engineering behind that alone is pretty sophisticated. It's all open source with Red Hat, so you can actually go into the OpenShift origin project and, and look at the source code yourself. But then, you know, if you talk to teams that, that embarked on the journey to actually write a uh, container platform themselves, they they're pretty quickly come to the realization that that's not, not, not a mean feat, so to speak. And then 
that's the blue layer is the platform con concerns. Kubernetes has emerged as the winner in the in the container orchestration game. There were different players in more proprietary um, approaches earlier, but through through the the Google ten years experience in how to orchestrate uh, containers, Kubernetes really emerged as the the winning um, orchestration platform. And, and really, it is container orchestration that drives the a consumer or customer service level agreements because Docker is important because it's the packaging format, but the runtime behavior and the scaling and the auto healing that's really driven by Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes is a very important, if not an even more important part in your entire container game. Then, I mentioned the early application lifecycle management with OpenShift, you can use whatever tooling you want, whether it's Bamboo or, or Jenkins, comes actually out of the box. It's really all API driven, so we at Red Hat believe that you shouldn't have to change your tooling or your behaviors if it's not necessary, right? So you just keep what you have. And then that drives the build automation and deployment automation, obviously. And then you have a, a, a comprehensive services catalog that I, I go into to later. But really also to drive the speed of application development, as the intro slide said, you want to drive a self-service um, behavior. You don't want to raise tickets and wait for weeks until a VMware is, is provisioned. You really, if you have an idea and you want to, you know, you know, ideate some some concepts and you want to do A/B testing, then it's it's really the, the best to um, give developers and and innovators in your organization the, the power to do that. And with self-service catalogs. You, you can actually do this, and, and the way it would look like you would log on to OpenShift, and you would uh, go into a designated environment, and then basically just develop the technology stack that you want to code in, whether it's WordX, whether it's Spring Boot, whether it's Java, whatever your organization has deemed as a as a safe and, and supported environment, you can can use. Then and then you the, the both worlds meet really. It's the security and the compliance, the governance aspect, and everything you need to securely run your enterprise, and it's also the you know the innovators and the the cool kids really that wanna that wanna try out new stuff and, and really uh, test new um, new ideas and on the on the vertical side on the right hand side we're not gonna go into much but they just there are cross cutting concerns right like the the management of of uh, container stack um, as well so that's really just intro to all those layers you need to to think of and. And one of them, another one is, for example, con um, project level isolation, where you want in a in a future IT operating model, you want to have a centralized platform, but you don't want to create bottlenecks in delivering your your IT solutions or your assets or your new products and features. So with a platform based approach, you can have multiple teams delivering projects or products or new features or services simultaneously. And one last point to storage. Because storage is is um, a funny one because it, it doesn't always uh, pop up in in conversations. But really, if you want a true cloud portability from let's say AWS to um, Azure or to Google Compute Engine, then you need to also think about the storage layer. So there is Cluster FS and um, and Ceph, and those storage solutions uh, allow you to actually have a consistent storage layer across any cloud provider, which then makes your workloads truly hybrid and and um, yeah, transportable and movable uh, to different cloud providers. So now let's look at specific behaviors we, we want. Like, Developers, uh, they want to build the code in a consistent manner. The operations people want reproducible, reproducible automated deployments and scaling. And then I mentioned DevOps before. It's um, they want both really, both of best of both worlds. They want consistent, reproducible, automated builds, deployment, and, and auto scaling. So now you might say, well, but that's not really a technology uh, concern as such. And you know, my answer is yeah, right. You are because it's actually more a culture change. And by working with a lot of clients, we actually had to come up with something that helps with that culture change, and it's um, it's the Red Hat Open Innovation Labs. And so culture change is defined as changing values and behaviors of, of teams, and also then we help organizations to 
uplift their capability. You know, like a decade ago, IT leaders were thinking of, of outsourcing um, their IT environment to application development or operations, but now they realize that is that has long gone because now IT and software development it has become more and more a competitive differentiator and, and really a core competency of your businesses. And so in terms of capabilities, you need to look, the capability dimensions are usually people, process, and technology. And the Open Innovation Lab is exactly such a package where Red Hat would come in with their subject matter experts and work with uh, your teams, your people, and define the new processes, like whether it's DevOps or Agile processes, and then use the tools and technologies that work for you. And that all is applied in a context of a minimum viable product where you define what is that that product that we want to uh, create and showcase how the new way, the new culture would develop that. An example would be a an ATM locator we, we've done with a, with a uh, large bank in, in Sydney, actually, where uh, there was an existing ATM locator function, and that's good because you have a baseline. You know how long a change would take to, to you know, create new features or, or to update or do a bug fix. And now with the Open Innovation Lab, we basically develop that in a DevOps and an Agile fashion. And now instead of just doing a new function release every Tuesday afternoon, once a month, they now can do it in, in literally minutes uh, and, and do a, a bug fix with automated testing, automated integration, and automated deployment. And, uh, and that's really what translates really easily then into um, a business value as such. So now container adoption pattern is, a, is another uh, topic I'd like to talk about. It's really when the container topic comes up in an organization or in your organization, then I think they're mostly uh, one or multiple of those four scenarios, right? So someone has already determined that container platform is what we need to look at, right? And then topics like Docker, Kubernetes, and, and container security come up, and you evaluate what are the, the best or the current players out in the market. Another uh, approach would be cloud native applications, right? You need the scale out capability. You have digital uh, services, and you, you need to you know, prepare for your, for your new digital workloads. For example, if you have a 1,000 API calls per minute, then you want to be ready and want to know that your applications, your microservices are um, responding and, and coping in a, in a consistent fashion. Then in a hybrid cloud scenario, I spoke a little bit about this earlier, whether you have your infrastructure as a service providers or your platform as a, as a service, either managed or self-managed, across hybrid environments. It could be an, an opera requirement. I think the opera is actually currently thinking about putting that down as a requirement that you cannot rely on a, on a single um, infrastructure uh, provider anymore. But nevertheless, um, if you have a high hybrid cloud environment, then you want to be able to shift and lift your, your workloads as appropriate, whether it's a security concern, a compliance concern, or just a simple cost um, um, matter in, in terms of running your workloads more cheaply on one provider versus the other. And then another um, another uh, adoption pattern is really business innovation, where the business needs to innovate because you have competitive pressures, your, your competition is getting more and more market share, you're losing profit, you, you're losing revenue, and the business is, is really needing this, uh, this innovation power. And, and whether it's a new business model or entirely new business model or whether it's just new products and services that you can't get out there fast enough often. And, and that's also then a, a good reason to look in containers and, and ex, uh, you know, examine new business models and new apps and, and, and services. So those are the ones um, that we usually see. If you have another one, more than happy to uh, get your input on that, but that's what I've been seeing in the last uh, two years. Then. Now, looking at, at more the technology layer again, is you have different environments usually. You have your, you know, your dev, your test, your UAT, your, your pre-prod, and your production environment. Or uh, new deplo new environments are, are often seen as um, dev, lab, and and prod, or beta, where you actually open up your new services to a uh, beta test community. But it doesn't really matter how you slice and dice that. You need tools along the way. So the container development kit is something you would install on your on your laptop and then give developers power to when they sit on the train, for example, and want to play around with new ideas that they can code and um, and develop new ideas and test it on their laptop. 
Atomic Host is uh, or Host is the um, it's a stripped down version of the Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux, which is you know um, the, the uh, SOE compliant uh, in, environment. Obviously, uh, big government agencies and, and security agencies are using that. It also r runs the the International Space Station. For example, so that's really a, a Linux or in, in an operating environment that you can can trust. And then you have the OpenShift container platform that does all the the automated packaging and, and loading and unloading of containers across your environments, as I just mentioned. So those are different aspects of this entire software development lifecycle um, that you wanna you might wanna think about. So. Apart from what I just mentioned, right, as the the open open shift um, uh, components, there is also a additional differentiated value in the container space, because containers are only as, as useful as the the application and the features and functions and services you actually provide. And uh, on the right hand side, we we have a concept like registry, where where your security and your your governance um, function can actually put or allow only container images or builder images that are, are certified, but you also have a management aspect like, like cloud forms, which allows you to not only manage your your containers, but also manage your hybrid uh, cloud environment. And then the, the red box on top is, is really the different uh, products, the different aspects of your architecture that you implement, right? If you have a if you have your reference architecture and it has different layers at the very top, let's say you have an experience layer and you have your API, your web or your mobile there, and underneath you might have a business logic layer, either driven by monolithic, distributed or microservices type applications, and then you have a data layer. And you can run all this on a single single platform, and that's uh, the the OpenShift platform. And so I, I know no other company at the moment in the market that has all their middleware portfolio containerized. So for us, OpenShift is a strategic um, platform, and whether it's the, the Red Hat uh, web server, the JBoss data virtualization, the you know business process management suite, uh, microservices, images based on uh, the Java microprofile, or the WordX or Spring Boot, our API management solution integration like Fuse or messaging, there's also messaging as a service now, or data grid. Everything uh, that Red Hat does is actually available as a, as a containerized image. And that's important for you because then you can develop your apps on, on supported images. So if there's a, a security concern or a, a, like a, a security breach like Heartbleed, for example, then you, you know that Red Hat will actually provide you a fix in uh, as a container image, and then you don't have to worry about it. And then with the deployment, a rolling deployment strategy, if you have everything configured like that, then it would be um, actually replacing running services with a zero downtime deployment and updating the, the underlying images without you having to lift a finger. So that's pretty pretty powerful as well. Just gives you another aspect of um, of how you can run and manage your containers. Then um, I mentioned self-service and user experience a little bit before. So there has been a, a, a new um, addition to the OpenShift container platform being added, and it's called the Open Service Broker API. So everyone who has a, a, a service that you can actually use out of your containers, you can actually, via a template, um, provide the service. You describe the service, and then the OpenShift as a platform would just uh, you would just be able to consume that service through OpenShift as a container platform. And at the moment, um, uh, there's tight collaboration with Amazon Web Services. So as you see on the on the left hand side, you have the Amazon RDS service at the at the top left corner, but you also have uh, the JBoss images there. And and again, right, uh, we talked about the, uh, the the power of self service, and and that's really Getting it to a to a new level where whether it's y your uh, service that you want to provide others to play around, or whether it's just uh, whatever your standard operating environment the services provide, you can just add them in a self-service catalog. Uh, and then your you know the the long waiting times for those services to pre be provisioned as, as VM images, for example, they are a thing of the past. 
I already uh, touched on this a little bit before, but container management is um, is also an, an important thing to think about. So there is there's a couple of um, of day two concerns that you that you need to be aware of, and they usually don't pop up in the first few conversations. But then once you have thousands of of containers running that that making up your your application, how how do you trace all those those log files, for example, or how do you know which of the error messages you're getting in your container platform are actually um, important and which are not. So there are then um, solutions like, let's say, PagerDuty that would then go through your log files and, and understand what that means. Or there's something like AI ops, right? If you look companies like MooCsoft or IPsoft, they allow you then to actually apply artificial intelligence to, to figure out what sort of error messages you need to, you need to, um, you know, escalate and, and really uh, call someone up, which one of your, you know, DevOps team is, is responsible to fix that bug, right? So there's a lot of day two thinking you, you need to, you need to think of before you go into production. But container management in, in general is, is a good way to, to summarize that. And as you remember the, the architect that got the, you know, emotionally attached to his or her first container, then this is now what we're talking at, um, about it at enterprise scale, really, because you have, you have thousands of, um, of them and you need to automatically and reliably uh, build and pack them, unpack them, load, update them, and, and track, really, containers, what's, um, what's going on in production. And in terms of container management, this is uh, the Red Hat solution. It's called uh, CloudForms. The open source project corresponding to CloudForms is called Manage IQ. So if you uh, Google Manage IQ, you find the GitHub repository and can actually uh, download and play around with it or even contribute it. But what you see on the on the right hand side is really you can uh, that's a, a topology, and you can see every single aspect of your microservices there. You can see the routes, you can see the nodes, you can even see the the host and the, the VM images um, as well as the ports and the containers that um, make up your, your microservices or your applications. If you hover over those, it also shows you the name of the actual applications running. So that's, that's um, for example, quite handy if you want to upgrade a specific node in your OpenShift cluster, then you want to first evacuate all the workloads of a specific node. And once that node has been evacuated, then you start the end schedule playbook that would do your, your upgrade, for example, or your patch. And then to summarize uh, this session is really, as my last slide, the, the container landscape. What are those things you want to be thinking of or want to be aware of? Yeah, a, a good starting point is actually that, that layered diagram that I showed you with the red, the green, and the, the blue layers to um, show specific concerns that you need to think about. There's also a, a blog that I wrote. It's called uh, PaaS considerations or platform as a service considerations that gives you also um, evaluation criteria that you you might want to think about, and it's not it's not written in a Red Hat specific way. It's just generally what are the concerns and the the building blocks you want to want to think about to to find your right approach. And so we covered the the format, which is uh, uh, the Mobi or X Docker format, and uh, govern now by the Open Container Initiative OCI. Then there is the host, and um, the underlying host is is actually what drives the, the efficiency and the reliability and the security of your container solutions. Um, then we have got the platform, and the platform is responsible for the automation of packaging and loading of containers, and also the service level agreements and your customer and, and user experience, really. And then there is the, the day two concerns, like I said earlier, which um, is summarized under, under management. So that was a, a quick run through. It was, um, I hope it wasn't too too much uh, or too fast, but there's a lot of different things to, to think about if you want to production, productionize your uh, your containers or thinking about containers. So we're always happy to obviously have a chat about that. But uh, for now, I'm handing over to you, Beth. <laughs> That's fantastic, Andreas. Thank you so much for that. Um, so what we might do now is actually go through to the questions from the audience. So if you have questions, guys, please pop them through to the chat panel and then we'll pick them up from there. But um, Andreas, are you ready for the first one? I hope so. Okay, okay let's, let's go. go. So, so um, let's talk about, about containers, containers um, a list. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, is that, is that the only option? option? 
uh, are all containers based, based on, on Linux, Linux? And if so, why is this the case? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So, um, because containers on, on Windows, that has been popping up uh, recently in some conversations with my clients as well. So, I think of uh, containers or the upper underlying container runtime, like Docker, for example, as, a, as an API that lets the, the clients uh, interact really with the with the runtime in, in clients, I mean more the command line interface really that you know builds and, and deploys your containers, and um, and that is the runtime then interacts with the kernel to to run those workloads. And a in a Linux container is nothing more than a process that runs on on Linux. It shares a, a host kernel with other containerized processes. So then when you think of things like um, SE Linux, for example, security enhanced Linux. And the fact that you can strip down Linux to bare bones to optimize it for specific work workloads, whether it's for an appliance, for example, or in this case, uh, containers, then that's for me a, um, a reason to run it on, on Linux. And furthermore, there are also, you know, both critical high value and high volume workloads uh, at the moment that, that run on a Reddit Enterprise Linux. I mentioned the International Space Station, Stock Exchange, Security Agency. So, um, I don't want to digress. So, is it the only option? No, it's not. But is it the best option? I, I think so. I might be biased. You know. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe just, just a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so, so here's your second, second question, question for you. Okay. okay. So, how, how do, do container, container provide security? security? Now, now security, security is a really, really hot topic, topic right? right? So, so it's really just that um, we're touching on this. So, so how do containers provide security and stability that customers look for when they deploy their application on containers? It's also a very good question. So um, it, it comes down to like security. It, so when you think of this layer diagram that I showed in my presentation, the different colors, the green, the blue, the, the red, then it, security obviously is applicable or you need to think about security in different levels, but let's start at the operating system level. So, uh, as I said be before, it, it's a process running on, on Linux and it shares a host kernel with other containerized processes, right? So, then you think, okay, so what makes ex what makes it a, a container then? So, each containerized process is isolated from other processes running on the same Linux host there, and they're using a concept called Linux, uh, or ker sorry, kernel uh, namespaces. Then, for example, the PID namespace uh, causes a containerized process to only see other processes inside of the container, but not processes from other containers on the shared host. Shared host. And, and that's important because if someone breaches a, into a container, then it's, it's isolated on the very lowest level, right? You can't just reach out and then get uh, more sensitive uh, workloads, right? Let's say there's an ATM locator and I breach into that. It's not much, there's, it's not a, a big deal, right? Because I'm just getting the locations of the ATMs. But then if I wouldn't have the security enhanced uh, Linux features that provide you uh, isolation of those processes, then I would just you know, be able to potentially breach into other containers that run a way more sensitive um, uh, workload, right? Or information as, as such. And then additional, security concerns on the file system uh, isolation, which is also provided through SC Linux and part of the Red and Enterprise Linux. And um, yeah, uh, resources consumed by, by each container, for example, memory, CPU, IOs are, are confined in, in specified limits, which, uh, which is called Linux control groups or C groups. And that eliminates the, uh, the noisy neighbor uh, type uh, approach. <laughs> So noisy neighbor basically taking all your uh, you know the, all all your resources away and, and that's that's also you know could be potentially uh, dangerous as well because then you, you get just the, the noisiest neighbor gets all the attention right and there's no CPU and no memory left for for any anything else so that's a very low level concern it might be a bit technical but as I said before there are many different concerns you need to think about right. And the ability to both isolate the containerized process and co confine the, the resources they consume is, is really what, what makes those multiple application containers run securely on a, on a shared Linux host. And the, and the combination of what I just said, the, the namespaces and the C groups uh, in terms of isolation resource confinement is what makes a Linux process a, a, a Linux container then. And that's what I think is fundamental to, to security of, of containers. And 
Then if you again look at those different uh, colored layers and beyond that operating system level, then going back to to other aspects is, for example, the, the certification and infrastructure service providers, such as Google, Azure, or, or Amazon Web Services, and the supported Docker containers, right? If there's a hard bleed bug somewhere, or if there's a, a data grid um, issue somewhere, or a data virtualization, a fuse, like integration a problem or messaging a problem, then uh, Reddit is providing those container images. So you don't have to touch your code, right? There's a concept called source to image where you point OpenShift to the source code and to the container image and then it builds it automatically for you. And and that's also, I think, a, a very important part of security. That's a long-winded answer, so apologies for that if I took a bit longer to answer this. But there's, as I said, there's a lot of things to consider if you really uh, want to understand container security. That's fantastic. Um, Andrea, so a bit from our audience asks, does the container talk to each other in the same way as Linux servers do? Um, do containers talk to each other the same way Linux containers do? So if you talk on a protocol level like TCP IP, yes, they do. But in terms of uh, the stack they go through, that's that's different, right? So they. Like in, in OpenShift as such, they they would use a specific network that is just created for inter-container uh, communication. And they are isolated via um, namespaces on the, the OpenShift container platform. Whereas if you look at hosts, it's really the, the data center setup, right? Your firewall rules that, that would determine that. So the answer to, to that question, it's a really good question, by the way, um, is Yes and no, no, sort of, right? So it depends on, so, sorry, depends on which, which level of communication you talk about, right? Protocol, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and then you just need to look at how your, your container runtime, whether it's OpenShift or any other container runtime, is really deployed and, and set up within your data center. I mean, I hope that answers your question. Um, so I, actually, we've got one more question, Andreas. Okay. Okay, so um, how do, Containers relate to the digital transformation. Ah, buzzword, bingo. Buzzword, digital <laughs> transformation. There we go. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it comes. So digital transformation. I think we need to start off with really, like digital transformation. What does it really mean, right? So there, there are many different aspects of of digital transformation. Again, some we we see talking to clients. It's all about the speed of delivery of new products, services, and, and the features through automation, then another one is the decoupling of, of existing assets like your core system. Right? So for example, you have a core banking system or your core ERP system. Those systems are usually not engineered to cater for those um, high volume of, of digital workloads like API calls, for example. Right? So an ERP system that is like 10 years old hasn't been engineered to really um, respond to a, a thousand API calls so quickly. So that's, that's also what um, what could be um, what could be considered digital transformation, right? Decoupling those existing assets through a reference architecture. So Reddit has a reference architecture, and that's what we've implemented. It's funny enough; it's not it's not industry specific, right? It's always the same sort of um, like Gartner calls it mode one and mode two, and mode two is the high cadence, um, and mode one is the low cadence uh, area. And, and high cadence is the cadence of change, right? So you're you're digital ninjas or those people who, who produce or ideate a lot of new ideas, they would then um, take, they need information to really create those um, those new digital services and, and the way they're doing it, they're abstracting the, the mode one layer, um, the, the low cadence, the low change uh, layer, like the ERP systems or the core banking systems with with a data uh, service layer that runs often on uses data virtualization or data grids in, in memory data grids. And that then allows you to reuse existing assets and all the information and knowledge and wisdom you have in your in your organization and then drive those um, those digital services. So that's uh, the architectural concerns of, of that. And containers obviously then fall into that uh, high cadence uh, area, right? So because that's how you, uh, with DevOps and Agile, that's how you develop those new features and put them uh, into production then do maybe a b testing uh, out of the box then um, another aspect of digital transformation is the new methodologies that I mentioned already so you're moving from a waterfall delivery methodology to devops and, and agile and um, obviously that 
feedback into containers, and then there's also uh, the, the culture change. So the, the reason I have the Open Innovation Lab slide in there is because culture change is a very big inhibitor if you don't get it right, right? Because it, it really, by having an agile project, you're involving the business. You go out to the business stakeholders, and whether it's marketing or sales or supply chain, right, you, or product development, you, you want to work with the business. And, and, and so that changes the, the culture a little bit because you, you might sit in a room and, and work on a sprint and then get a new feature out and you can A-B test it immediately. And, and that is very different to like processes maybe applied 10 years ago, right, where you would have to write a business case and a requirements document and then you wait for your VM image and, and things like this. And um, one more point, otherwise you run out of time, right? So <laughs> the, the, the IT operating model is, is another point I want to talk about. So we, we see that like there's a concept of center of excellence uh, often present in our client base, and that is basically a, a, a defined group of IT uh, SMEs that know how to do integration right or application development. But the mission of the center of excellence was always around delivery. So when that naturally creates a bottleneck, right, because all the projects that they are piling up in front of this uh, center of excellence team, because they're the only ones who really know how to how to do this well. And, they are often also a code or develop against uh, one single technology stack. And now with a platform-based approach and a container approach, you can now run different technologies with um, different agile delivery teams in parallel, right? So your security guys are happy, your governance is happy, your enterprise architects are happy because you, you're running on a, on a defined and, and secured environment, but also your business teams are happy because you're not piling up those projects anymore because now the center of excellence has now a different mission. It doesn't, its mission is not delivery anymore, it's now enablement. So those people become from, from coders, they become coaches and trainers and enablers and work with, with the business, right? And that changes the entire IT operating model by giving you a, a, a tenfold, for example, throughput through the delivery pipeline. And, and the IT is the not any further um, seen as a, as a as slow or as non-responsive, right, or as, as costly, they're actually on the front foot and they go out and become active business partners. So again, a long-winded answer, but that, that's all sort of related to containers and the container platform as well, how you deliver your, your projects.